Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about more space science. I'm James. I'm Corey. And as you will notice throughout the broadcast today, Corey is wearing a greenish, <laughs> his greenish stripes on his shirt, which means that uh, the computer tries to put the green screen image on his shirt sometimes, but only flickeringly. So we're just going to have fun with that. Um, we did that on purpose, right? Right, right. <laughs> Today we're talking about the space shuttle, which is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things. Now, I thought I knew quite a bit about the space shuttle, which is why I was like, yeah, let's talk about the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. As I was doing my research on this over the last couple of days and putting together the slides that we're going to look at today, I learned so much more. <laughs> if you are uh, in our age range, uh, if you are an adult in your late 20s, 30s, this is the primary real life spaceship that I grew up with and probably you too. Um, this is the uh, only way I ever knew about getting to space growing up. If I ever right. saw anything on TV or in movies. It was what was modern. It was what was cool. Yeah. It was normal. It yeah. was normal. Like, yeah, we're just going to hop in a plane that goes to space and just, you know, head Fly up to space down. real quick. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but rockets being used like a you know a normal rocket what we think of as a rocket like a stacked cylinder type vehicle like we're using again with spacex and whatnot yep those have mostly been phased out pretty much for the last few decades yeah the idea in fact let's jump into the slideshow because also he doesn't know anything that we're going to talk about to, well no <laughs> correction he knows a lot of stuff he knows a lot of stuff but um, I haven't shown him anything that I have prepared, so I have some fun surprises in there for everyone. I'm like you guys here at home. Uh, a lot of this information, it's fun for me too to find out for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's hop into the slideshow. Here we go. And let's also hop into the Q&A really quick and just uh, see who's there. I love taking questions. I love answering questions. And um, what has happened in the past with these space webinars is we'll be talking about, I don't know, the planets. And we'll go off on a, a bunch of people who have questions in the Q and a section about like, what about this? And I'm like, you know what, let's just do an entirely separate webinar on that subject specifically. So if there's something that you'd like to talk about, if there's something that you'd like to learn about in space, let me know in the Q and a section and yeah. it could be an entire webinar. It might be something that we could answer today, but it might be a That's right. topic that we could take up another day too. Yeah. All right, a bunch of people in there saying, hi, hello, everyone. Kanan said that they watched the SpaceX launch the other day. Yes, that's great. As I said in our webinar on Monday morning, um, NASA and SpaceX especially, they do live YouTube broadcasts of almost every launch that they do. And if you, if you have the time and you're able to watch that, go and watch it. You can watch it live or you can watch the recording afterwards I and you'll learn a ton. They do an incredible job at letting you know what's going on, like step by step. Uh, even if it's like a moment where there's not really a lot happening visually, they're always telling you like really interesting behind the scenes information. Mm -hmm. uh, I learn so much every time I watch one of those. I love it. It's really entertaining, but it's like really educational too. Yep. So good job, Kanan. <laughs> All right, cool. Here we go. Slideshow. So as you were talking about what, yeah, okay, space shuttle, yada, yada. Great. Here is the Saturn V rocket with an Apollo mission on the top. I think that's Apollo 17. Um, and as you said, it's the stacked cylinder. You've got a cylinder with a bunch of fuel that is mm -hmm. launching another cylinder with a bunch of fuel mm -hmm. that's launching a third cylinder with a bunch of fuel with a little capsule on top of humans yeah and that's how we were primarily getting to space for a long time because it's a good design um but as i say here you know we, we landed humans on the moon mm -hmm. and that was 1969 as soon as that was done nasa was already looking at what's next mm -hmm. what's the next big milestone that we need to go after you it, it's important to have goals yeah and and space missions take a lot of money and a lot of time. It takes a lot of money and a lot of time. You can't land on the moon and then decide, okay, what are, what are, what are we doing now? You already have to be like years out planning. Years ahead. Next. Exactly. So the final Apollo mission launched, this is Saturn V, 
and it launched in um, 1972, the end of 1972. Earlier in that same year, President Nixon had already publicly announced, like, the Apollo program is shutting down, here's what's next. So even before the Apollo, even before this picture was taken, uh, NASA already knew that they wanted to do some kind of space shuttle mm -hmm. thing. A lot of ideas were thrown around, uh, but they, the one idea that they always kept coming back to was a shuttle, a reusable plane that can go to space. Can we define that word for a second? So a shuttle, yes, a shuttles have been things for thousands of years. You yeah. could have a shuttle that was like a ship or mm -hmm. like a, a, a car can be a shuttle. What does shuttle mean? Yeah, so itself? shuttle is, is a thing that takes people back and forth between usually two primary locations. You go to the airport, you land, and then you get in a van or a bus. And that's, the, that's your shuttle to the car rental place or to the hotel mm -hmm. or you know to the downtown of the city where you're going. Mm -hmm. So the concept of a shuttle is being a practical, reusable thing that you can use over and over again to go back and forth between two places, such as um, you know Kennedy Space Center in Florida and a not yet existing space station, which Again, in 1972, they already had the concept of like, guys, 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 <laughs> let's make a space station. No, 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 I know we already have a space station, but like, let's make a bigger, better one. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. One of the, one of the, I don't know if you'd call it an issue, but one of the things that maybe not everybody knows about the early rockets is that the, the Saturn V rockets and all the other types of rockets, they would launch into space and the, all the pieces below the part that had people in it they would just fall back into the atmosphere and burn yep. up usually. They'd burn up or they'd splash into the ocean. Maybe sink. <laughs> yeah. So we, we could get people into space, but all the money spent building that vehicle, you usually, it was, you know, gone. It was it like was, the whole you, thing. You're literally destroyed. burning money. It'd and be like uh, if, you, if you, every day when you drove to school, if you jumped out of the car and then your car exploded. Yeah, you just... <laughs> You jump out, <laughs> car crashes, and then in order to get back, or like to get to school the next day, you, you need another car. <laughs> you have to go buy a whole new car. <laughs> and it has one trip and that car crashes. So the, the idea, I guess, was uh, what if we had a car that could drive to school and back from school as well? <laughs> and then, and then, hear me out here. Crazy idea. What if it could then drive back to school again? again? Why? So that was the idea, right? The, the difficulty, though, for something going to space is probably a million times more difficult mm -hmm. than driving a car, though. Yes. So it's not I like... I assume. <laughs> I've driven a car. I have not driven a car to space. So Yet. Yet. But Elon Musk has. He didn't drive the car. He just launched it to <laughs> space. There's a subtle difference. Anyway. So the, the idea of having, like, a spaceship that could go to space and come back it wasn't that it was like some crazy idea nobody had ever no, thought. No, it was a before. really good idea. Here's but the it was only probably problem. incredibly difficult. To Going accomplish. to space is hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. So they threw together a lot of ideas. I mean, space engineers, space scientists, these are some of the smartest people in the history of humankind. So they came up with some really cool ideas. And one of my favorite ideas was this. This was one of the first concepts for a space shuttle. And awesome. Right? And um, this was a two-stage space shuttle. So instead of launching straight up, like you see the space shuttle doing behind us, mm -hmm. um, it would be a shuttle on top of another shuttle, basically. A plane on top of a plane. That first plane would take it up to about 50,000. The it, bottom one, the one marked B2? Mm -hmm. Okay. It would take off from a runway. Mm -hmm like you're at the airport, and it would go up to about 50,000 feet. And then that top half of it, the actual shuttle that would go to space. It's marked three here. Mm -hmm, it would separate, and that would then fly up to space. That Both of those me, are piloted, by the way. I don't know if this is in your slideshow or not, but that reminds me of a few years back. Uh, is that in your show? It's not in the slideshow, okay. <laughs> but I should have added a slide. Virgin Galactic, yeah. uh, which is a modern space company, they are using almost that exact same concept. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different. The, the shuttle, the part that goes to space is carried under the plane, mm -hmm. but it takes you up and goes up to about 50,000 feet. And then the space plane part of it drops away, ignites its engine and 
off to space. Kanan says here, so kind of like a rocket that launches a rocket. In it's a, a rocket that launches a rocket, yes. Yeah. yeah, or a plane that launches a plane, a thing that launches a thing. <laughs> oh, this is a quick side note here. Uh, in our last space science webinar, uh, Milo was asking about what would happen with a lava lamp in space, and we didn't know. I was like, yeah, I don't know, you got me. <laughs> so you challenged Milo <laughs> to find out. He All right, says, let's see what you got, Milo. He says that without gravity, the wax will melt because the lava inside of the lava lamp is wax that gets heated up, right? So without gravity, the wax will melt and most likely float around in just a ball until it reaches the other end of the glass and cools enough to get stuck there. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Milo. Thank you for finding out. <laughs> I think the next webinar might need to be hosted by Milo. <laughs> we'll just have a guest. Yeah. There we go. Thanks, Milo. Yeah, right. so that was one of the ideas, and it was a it was a good idea. It was mm -hmm. a practical idea. They they didn't go that direction, but mm -hmm. as you said, the exact concept mm -hmm. is now in use today, and um, it's it's not something that NASA uses, but it's a private company. They mm -hmm. launch tourists to space. Um, you don't go to the space station, but you can get a couple minutes of zero gravity up there. Mm -hmm. It takes you right to the edge of our atmosphere right to the edge of space. I think it's one of the things about science and engineering is that there's not necessarily only one right way to do this. Right. There's like multiple different, you know. There's a lot of trying. wrong ways to do it. <laughs> and then there's a few right ways. Yeah. Take the light bulb, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Edison was, said, I didn't find one way to invent a light bulb. I found a thousand wrong ways to invent one or something First. like that. Yeah. Right. He had to go through a lot of wrong ways before. Yeah. He made a way. thousand light bulbs that didn't work until yeah. he finally came to the design. But how many different designs of light bulbs are there today? A there's lot. A lot. And there's two or three or four different main approaches, completely mm -hmm. different ways to generate light in a little bulb. Mm -hmm. They're all correct. Yeah. They all work. Yeah. So there's more than one way to get to space. So after, so it was 1972 that it was officially announced, like, hey, we're making a space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And nine years later, the first launch happened. So this is the first ever space launch. This was STS-1, which we're going to talk about what that means. But the most important part of that is the num numeral one. It's the first one. So it's April 12th, 1981. And there it is lifting off. Um, it was a short mission. They were only up in space for like two days. The purpose of this mission was to go up, orbit for a while, come back, everything works, great. Now, now we know we, we can actually do stuff. It's like a test of the concept here. Yes, exactly, it's a test flight. Um, there were, I think, two or three humans on board that one, although the shuttle has room for seven people. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one big, big, big difference between this launch and every other shuttle launch. Can you, can you see the difference between this picture on, yeah. on the screen and the one Sitting behind us. The main thing that I notice is that from, you know, growing up seeing shuttle launches uh, and just looking at the picture behind us too, is that the big main middle tank, mm -hmm. which I believe is a fuel tank. That's just a fuel tank. It's, that's it's that, that's not even color. a rocket in the middle there. It's just a giant fuel tank. Because you need so much fuel. In the picture behind us, uh, you can see it's like this kind of orangish, mm -hmm. bronzish color. Uh, and in the picture that we're sharing here, it's a white. That's right. Gray color. That's right. So for that first launch, they painted that, that center uh, external fuel tank, they painted it white because, I mean, it the, looks awesome. The rest of it is all sort of a uniform color. That's right. The natural color of the insulation that they put on the outside of that fuel tank, which is just styrofoam, by the way. That's all it is. It's just fancy styrofoam, but the natural color of it is that um, kind of orange color. And they didn't paint it on future launches because they wanted to save weight. Hmm. There's just no reason to paint it, basically. There's no reason to paint it other than it looked cool. But it might look cool, but it adds weight. And, okay, how much does paint really weigh? Not a lot. But when something's that big. But when it's that big, let's call it a few hundred pounds of paint, maybe a thousand pounds of paint. I'm totally guessing here. But it's at least more than a couple of pounds. And every ounce of weight that you add to that spacecraft costs you more money. Yeah. It, it takes more fuel to launch it up into space. Yeah. So gorgeous. Uh, what do I have next? Oh yeah. So what does STS stand for? It stands for Space Transport System. 
That's pretty straightforward. Very straightforward. But it sounds cooler to say, yeah, so uh, STS-1, <laughs> I, I, I flew on STS-100. So on STS-1, did they have a name for the shuttle itself? Because people usually like to name their ships, their yeah. spaceships. That's right. In fact, that's the next slide. So each shuttle itself, each individual piece that was made, uh, each individual space plane that was made had its own name, but then each mission, each time it launched, it had a unique number to it. Okay. So we'll go to the next one here. There were five shuttles made, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor. And each of those launched several missions. So um, I think it was, oof, I can't remember which shuttle launched first. Did I say on there? Columbia, good. So Columbia launched on STS-1. It was also STS, I don't know, seven, and also STS 14. I'm guessing on these. I don't know if th those are the exact mission numbers. Because they kind of, they probably cycled through them instead of. That's right. Okay. Yep. It just depended on like, you know, which one is ready to fly again. And if they planned these things out many, many, many months in advance, if not more. All right. Uh, question for you. So, yes. Did they build all of these shuttles at the same time? They built them one at a time. The first one that was built, uh, so Endeavor was the first one uh, that actually rolled off the pad and it was the initial test shuttle. And they used it for a few different things for some testing and stuff like that. And then, um, and then later on converted into a shuttle that could actually launch. The first thing they, they used it for was um, gliding test flights. They would. They would put it on the, the top of a 747, mm -hmm. which I have a picture of later. Yeah. They would fly it up into the air. There was no fuel on or anything like that. And it would detach from the plane and then just glide back to Earth. There's and, a, and, a scene and, in the movie Superman Returns that shows a space yeah. shuttle detaching from a plane like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm here with the superhero. Today, <laughs> exactly. 24-7. Yeah. So en Endeavor was the first test model that came out. Columbia was the first one that launched, uh, but they had to make them one at a time. They didn't have more than one factory. Um, and are all the, I mean, they visually here, they look identical. Was mm -hmm. every space shuttle identical or do they try different things with each one? Each one that they built, they got a bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, Columbia was the heaviest of the space shuttles mm -hmm. and each space shuttle made after that. And each time they would bring it into the hangar and take it apart and fix and replace things each time it would get a little bit better. They'd find ways to like maybe use lighter parts or- Exactly, like in the early 2000s, all of them had their screens replaced one by one. All the screens were replaced inside the cockpit because they used to have, I mean, you remember the old TVs, it was, it was big TVs were like yeah. this wide and that thick, yeah. that deep. Old um, computer monitors were much bigger too. Exactly. So and they replaced them with like- Modern screens are, a lot thinner, which yeah. means they're a lot lighter, which means they're a lot cheaper to launch. So right. Columbia was the heaviest, each one after that, it got a little bit lighter, got a little bit better. And they, they were able to learn and apply what they had learned to uh, each shuttle. Uh, we're gonna take a quick uh, question break here. Yes. Um, April asked, what are we talking about? April, we're talking about the space shuttle program, which in our image back here that we have on the screen today, uh, it was a type of spaceship that we launched for a few decades. Yeah. Uh, that's not used anymore, but uh, it was a really cool type of ship. So we're talking really all about cool. it today. Yeah. Um, another question here. This one, uh, this is kind of a sidetrack, but uh, just an interesting question. Uh, Katya ask, asks, does Mars have carbon dioxide? If it does, just bring a lot of planes to Mars. Katya, I love the way you think. It does have carbon dioxide. It has a lot of carbon dioxide relative to the mixture of air that we have here on Earth. The problem is, is that the atmosphere on Earth is 100 times more dense than, than the atmosphere on Mars. If you were to take all the air in this room and compare it to the same size room on Mars, there's a hundred times more air in here than there would be in the room on Mars. So while there's a lot of carbon dioxide 
in the atmosphere, it's not very thick and it wouldn't be enough for the plant to survive. Now, we could just make a little bubble in there and pump the air in so that it's the right pressure for the plants to grow. There's gonna be a lot of plant science done on Mars when we're able to get the right laboratories out there, get people out there, plant some gardens, look at how does stuff grow on Mars. It's, we are gonna learn so much in the next 50 years. It's going to be crazy. The, the whole idea of like bringing plants or, or, or water or making things be able to live on Mars or another planet, it is, it's a really, it's a whole subject called terraforming. Mm -hmm. That word terra usually meaning like earth or land. So the idea there is like take like reforming the land of Mars, maybe into something that we could live there. Yeah. Because right now, if you wanted to live on Mars, you would need to live in a dome or a bubble. But hopefully in the future, we could figure out a way to make Mars like another planet you could just live on and live outside and breathe the air and there'd be plants. So that would be amazing. Caught yet? You could help make it happen. That's right. <laughs> you could be our botanist, our plant scientist that we bring with us to Mars. Okay, so the final space shuttle was STS-135. There were 135 wow. shuttle missions launched. I didn't know there was that many. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, here's a picture of that final launch happening. That's the space shuttle Atlantis there. It launched July 8th, 2011, landed on July 21st, 2011. And when it landed, July 21st, 2011, it ended, let's see, 89, 90, 30 years, 30 years of operation for the space shuttle program, which is really amazing, especially considering the fact that they were not supposed to still be flying. <laughs> really? What yeah. was the original plan? Like how long did they expect to be flying? Like 10 years. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So here we are in 2011, we were still going to space with technology from the 1970s. <laughs> when you put it that way. <laughs> when you put it that way, you're like, whew, it's a good thing that we uh, decided to move on. It was a great program. I, I mean, most people in 2011 were not driving cars from the 1970s. No, so. <laughs> but when you drive a car from, the 19, from 1972, you know it. Yeah. You're like, this is, wow, look at the radio. Look at those switches. Wow, this is, it handles different. It's funny, the seat's not as comfortable. Like everything <laughs> has gotten better since then just because, I mean, we're humans. We have the capability to learn new things and apply mm -hmm. it to the future. That's and you're talking about it, they were changing out screens and probably a lot of other technology inside the shuttle. Every time it landed and they took it back and they went to go fix stuff up, it took a lot of work to get it ready to fly again. They're constantly replacing systems, constantly fixing things. We're gonna get a little bit more into that later. All right, what's next? I completely forget what order I put all these slides in. <laughs> okay, how heavy was this thing? It was almost four and a half million pounds when it launched. Four and a half million pounds. So the shuttle itself would weigh 172,000 pounds. Uh, it was able to carry over 55,000 pounds of stuff with it up to space. Let's think of a comparison. I, uh, I can drive one yes. of the school school buses. I think our heaviest school bus is, I think it's like either 32 or 36,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So 55,000 pounds, that's about one and a half school buses. Yeah. Which on one hand seems like a lot, but on the other hand, it seems like maybe not as much as I would want to, <laughs> right. to be able to send into space for the amount of work that it takes. Exactly. But still, one and a half school buses into space is pretty Listen, big. if you're smart with that school bus and you pack that school bus and you have every inch of it designed to make maximum use of the space, yeah. hey man, you can do a lot of stuff with that. Yeah. And that's how the International Space Station was built. Mm -hmm. It was launched in pieces. Most, a lot of that International Space Station was launched in the cargo bay of a space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And the space shuttle, oh, that's the picture I forgot to add. A picture of the space shuttle docked on the International Space Station. Looks amazing. Maybe next time. Anyway, they launched it piece by piece. And you're reminding me of, it's kind of like Legos. They, yeah. they, wouldn't, they didn't bring the space station up there built in one piece they had to bring up kind of the legos and then build it in yeah. orbit over dozens of missions from i mean the united states did a lot but russia deserves a lot of credit too because a lot of the stuff russia launched those things up and mm -hmm. and built it up there and a lot of other countries have pieces up on the space station too it That's truly right. is an international it effort. really is it really is so um 
other things that we're launching up there. Each of those side, let's see, I hope you can see my mouse here. These side boosters here, those yellow, the yellow, I know colors. Those white cylinders on the side there. That are marked C. Those are, that are marked C. Those are solid rocket boosters. It's not liquid fuel in there. It is packed with solid fuel that once you ignite it, once you start burning those side boosters, there's no stopping it. There's no turning off the pump. Those rockets are going to burn until all the fuel is gone. That reminds me of like a model rocket. Uh, if you've ever launched a model rocket, you have these little cylinders mm -hmm. that if you look inside, it's hard packed solid material in there. That's the same thing. When you light it, it's going to burn all the way through. That's right. You can't stop like a model rocket, like <laughs> engine halfway or something. Nope. It's just going to keep going until it burns out. So those weighed 1.3 million pounds together. Um, the fuel inside those is actually powdered aluminum is, is what the majority of that fuel wow. was. Seriously? Yeah. Like go to your kitchen, take aluminum foil. If you were to grind that aluminum foil up into a really fine powder, that's essentially what the fuel was in those solid rocket boosters. It's just amazing. I had no idea. Yeah. You have one roll of it in your kitchen. They had 1.3 million pounds of it. <laughs> In those side boosters. It's amazing. And then that external fuel tank was another almost 1.7 million pounds of just fuel. Okay, so that marked D here, the external fuel tank, that's a different type of fuel. Different type of fuel. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Okay. So it launches up. They leave their payload in space, the satellite that they're delivering or the part of the space station or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they lose about payload. They're just meaning like whatever they carried, the, right? Yeah. Payload being the thing you the carried. Legos that they brought. The up. Legos, <laughs> uh, fifty-five thousand pounds of Legos. Um, obviously, you don't have the weight of the external fuel tank because that detaches when you're done with it. You don't have the weight of the solid rocket boosters because those detach when you're done with it. So it launches at four and a half million pounds and it lands at one hundred and fifty-one thousand pounds. Wow. Cool. All right. I think I'm taking too long and everything again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. We're going to keep going. Oh, this is, listen, one of the amazing things that the space shuttle did was deliver the Hubble Space Telescope to orbit. Now, could we have launched the Hubble Space Telescope without a shuttle, just stick it on a rocket and send it up there? Yeah, of course. But that's boring. <laughs> we want to send people to do the machine, the job that a machine can do. So April 24th, 1990, they delivered the Hubble Space Telescope to orbit. And it wasn't just like, well, we want to send people. There was actually a really good reason for sending people because they wanted to know that they could get to that point in space and come back mm -hmm. because they went there five more times between 1993, or actually I think, I, a total of five times. So they, they dropped it off and then they went back four more times between 1993 and 2009. Is that to fix things or to add things pieces, to or? replace things? The first thing they happen, they happen, you know, they dropped Hubble off. They're like, okay, bye. They come back to Earth. Scientists turn on Hubble and they start taking pictures with it, and everything was blurry. Oh wow! There was a mistake in one of the lenses. It was like one micro inch wrong, and everything was blurry. And they're like, and that no. wasn't something that the the that the telescope could fix on its own or adjust on its own it was just a badly just a mistake lens it's like if you got the wrong prescription of eyeglasses just everything's blurry mm -hmm. so the next mission up there they actually brought a corrective lens they basically gave, brought glasses for the hubble that <laughs> fixed that problem that's amazing but they they went and they replaced batteries and different components that were starting to get old and they were able to extend the life of the hubble by a long time it's still up there still operating but each time it took people going there and you can see totally move yeah that's a human attached to the mobile space arm that is part of the space shuttle built by canada i know that yes canada <laughs> built that arm at the canadian space agency brilliant mm -hmm. people amazing it's called the canada arm really? get it yep oh, that's awesome. canada arm canada cool. arm. <laughs> all right moving on Oh, this was just a really cool picture. May 1979, again, the first shuttle launched in 81, but 1979, Space Shuttle Enterprise, they rolled it out to the launch pad, they hooked it up, they did a bunch of tests, and, you know, you want to test things a lot before you actually do a launch. So people got to see it for the first time. Mm -hmm. That's just a cool picture. That's, all, that's the only reason I put that there. Awesome. 
This is also a cool picture. Here's the Challenger in 1983, rolling slowly. It's it's on this giant moving platform, these giant wheels that move it like mm -hmm. one or two miles an hour. You mm -hmm. can walk faster than this thing rolls. And it has to drive like three and a half miles from the assembly building to the launch pad. So it, it takes a while. Uh, but that's just a gorgeous picture of it rolling through the morning fog there in Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, let's see. In 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia uh, broke up on reentry, unfortunately. The Space Shuttle was lost. We lost the seven astronauts that were on board it. It was a tragedy. It was a really big problem. They found out afterwards that the heat shield on the, other, on the underside of the shuttle had taken damage when it was lifting off and they hadn't caught that. They hadn't noticed that. Um, so of course they did a ton of fixes to make sure that that would never happen again. Mm -hmm. So what if you launch on a space shuttle and you get, you know, your heat shield gets damaged during the launch and you can't safely come back? Mm -hmm. Well, they changed their procedures after that. There was always another mission ready to go to go rescue the first space shuttle if something went wrong. Wow, so they actually have two launch pads here. One of them is going to go and the other one's going to be ready to go? That's right. So this, this was a pretty unique situation here. Usually the way it was, was whatever shuttle mission was going to be coming up next, let's say you're launching an STS-125. A few of the crew members of STS-126 were ready to launch early in case they needed to come and get you. Um, they wow. usually wouldn't have both of them out there at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'll explain why this was different. But let's say one shuttle launches, something goes wrong. In 40 days, the next shuttle would launch. They would, hmm. they would completely get everything ready. They would, they would have to fix some stuff in the next shuttle, get it ready to go. It would take them 40 days, but that's okay. Because you can stay in space for 40 days. They could stay in space for more than 40 days. So and you're saying even if they sent them up there to do like a quick job and to come back, mm -hmm. they would make sure they had enough food and water and everything that they could be up there for a couple months. That's right. Yeah. That's good. And the, the basic plan was, let's say you launch and you can't come back. The plan was go to the International Space Station, dock there and live on the space station mm. for that month and a half until rescue came. Now, why would it take 40 days? If they're, couldn't they just have the other shuttle be kind of ready to go also? That's a lot of work a lot of work and it's work that you don't have to do if you don't need to do it so it'd be a lot of unnecessary work if everything a lot of unnecessary perfect. work and a lot of expense so yeah. uh, it was expense that they could save but also their astronauts wouldn't be in danger got it up there so that specific thing wow our picture got funny there that's just what happened there yeah here i'm just gonna take over the mouse really quick um while uh, we're working on that yep uh, there's a good question here from Alet, I think. Here we go. Yeah, from Alet asking, so what's the difference between a rocket and a space shuttle? Yes, okay. I, so, asked, I said a similar thing the other day, and James let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I, we kind of got into a fight about spaceships. A talking. It was a the, lot of discussion. fun. We got into a productive conversation, <laughs> right? Um, a rocket is a specific kind of thing. You have fuel, it launches, it's cylindrical, right? The shuttle itself is not a rocket. Mm -hmm. um, those things on the side, cylinder, fuel inside, those are rockets. And it, it has to do with the exact kind of engine and makeup of it. And I could probably come up with better explanation, but we're a little bit pressed on time and I didn't think you'd bring this up again. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alette brought it up. <laughs> Would oh. you say, so what, on the I think bottom, you and Alette are in league with each other. So the, the, the side bits, yes, I want to call those rockets. You okay. can call the whole thing together a rocket and I'm fine with that. Um, but the space shuttle itself is not a rocket. It launches with the help of rockets. Awesome. All right. Uh, I think there was one other question <laughs> here. Um, Jacob asked, how many people can uh, be on a space shuttle at the same time? I have slides for that. Great. Seven, and I'll show you how they sit. Awesome. All right. right. Uh, okay, so this on specific one, um, this, was the, this was in 2009 that this picture was taken. Mm -hmm. I said that the last shuttle mission up to the Hubble Space Telescope was in 2009. Yeah. That was that shuttle. 
Here's the, the one thing, in the though. back. Yeah, the one okay. in the back. That one, if they got stuck up there and they were in trouble, they would mm-hmm. not be able to make it to the International Space Station. Just based on where things were in That's orbit right. at the time? That's right. That's just the way orbits work. Um, so they would not have 40 days in order to get help. Mm-hmm. So that other shuttle was there, ready to go, and it would be able to launch three days after the first one if something went wrong. So this is one time they did have them both ready. One time. Got it. But it's just a cool picture. Yeah. It makes me think this looks more like a, you know, like a, if you think of the idea of spaceport, kind of be more like an airport. We got rockets Planes coming everywhere. and going, shuttles yeah. coming and going. There's two on the pads at the same time. Exactly. This is what we thought the future would look like. So here's a bit of a cutaway showing the uh, kind of the insides of the space shuttle. You can see here in this one, there's doors that cover the cargo bay, this big empty spot in the middle where they could put the things that they're trying to take up with them. Mm -hmm. It would launch with those doors closed. And then when they needed to get to the stuff inside, they would open the doors. Okay. And here you can see what looks like a satellite that they're bringing up, or that's where you would stick a part of the space station that you're bringing up. Sometimes they would have uh, a compartment that was called Skylab and it would just sit in there and it was like extra living space and laboratory space. Sometimes the shuttle- so they could do experiments while they were in orbit. Exactly. And they would have more space to live during like the two week mission that they were up there. Because this part at the front of the shuttle is the only part that people could actually be in. That's right. So you can see there's three seats that they're showing right there. There's actually four seats and they're just not showing it very well. But I have another diagram in a moment. Um, so really their only living space is this tiny little apartment at the front. There was no way to kind of like, we see the, the back of the, the shuttle where there are, you know, there's rocket boosters. There's all these engines and stuff back here. It wasn't like there was like a tunnel or a crawl space to get back there or something, right? Okay. Nope. It's not like, you know, there's no place to hang out back there if you wanted some like time to like read a book or something. Imagine you and six friends (laughs) living in an RV for two weeks. Now imagine that that RV is smaller. Yeah. Welcome and, to space. <laughs> and you can't, you can't step outside for a Nope. <laughs> Don't open the window for fresh air. You're not going to have it. This is the cockpit. This is just, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's really complicated. There's so many switches. There's so many screens. It looks similar to like a, a plane cockpit though. If you've seen the inside of like a, like a jet cockpit, like when getting on or off. Very plane. much. Here's the thing. We know how to make cockpit cockpits for planes we know how to design and run those and we know how to work them so we took what we knew and Mm -hmm. we adapted it for a new environment Hmm. we'll keep going here okay so here's the the seating so number one and two that's your pilot and co-pilot and then three four five six seven uh those are just the rest of the crew members on there so they'd have other jobs once they got to orbit exactly but like during a launch they or landing they were probably just passengers. That's right. And I would definitely want to be on that top deck there because they numbers five, six, and seven, they don't even have a window. It's just, <laughs> they're, they're just looking at like a wall, basically. It's like worse than the middle seat on a plane. Yes, because, you even, yeah. You can't exactly. even see the window over somebody else's shoulder or something. Exactly. All right, we're, we're going to go a little bit quicker here because I did that thing where I took way too much time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here, here's a picture on the inside of how that would look. Um, for an actual, during a launch, that girl would not be standing there with a clipboard. Um, This is just showing the arrangement like before they launch. Exactly. Also, because she is able to stand there, uh, this shuttle must be oriented like it's 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 on the ground. It's it's on the ground. Because I assume when they got into the shuttle, you know, it's it's tilted back. So you'd, you'd be climbing into a seat that was like, on the ground, basically. Yeah, lying on its back. Here's another cutaway. So in, if I may, in this cutaway of this solid rocket booster, you can see it's just solid fuel there. Mm -hmm. And again, it's mostly aluminum. Mm -hmm. Um, The center fuel tank has two kinds of uh, liquid fuel in it. One is liquid oxygen. The other one is liquid hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Oh, way down there at the bottom, there's like that little orange suited person. You can see how big this is by seeing that small. Yeah, this is massive. So there's oxygen and hydrogen, and all.
all of that fuel from that big external fuel tank uh, went into the engines at the bottom of the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. The space shuttle does not have fuel tanks for those three main engines. Mm -hmm. All of that fuel comes from the external fuel tank. Mm -hmm. So it combines the hydrogen and the oxygen, mm -hmm. and it makes an, an explosion and fire and boom and propulsion, meaning that a lot of the exhaust from a rocket launch was just water. Hmm. Hydrogen, oxygen, water. That's amazing. Yeah. Isn't that a cool picture? That's a real picture. That's a space shuttle launching, coming out through the clouds. Passing plane took that picture. Wow. That's just cool. <laughs> okay, so yesterday, or two days ago, I told Corey. Oops. Sorry about that. There we go. I told Corey that the space shuttle had more than one million moving parts. I was wrong. Well, I was correct, but I, <laughs> I didn't have the right number. It had more than two and a half million moving parts. That's this incredible. was and still is the most complicated machine that humans have ever made, ever. So one of the problems with it was there was two and a half million moving parts. Every moving part is something that can break, mm -hmm. you know? My mouse is a very simple machine. It has only a few moving parts, left click, right click, scroll wheel, it's about it. Every time I click that left button, there's a chance that it could break. It's wearing out a little bit every time. It wears out a little bit every yeah. time. You know, I had a mouse a few years ago, the right button stopped working. That, so that's like three, four moving parts, two and a half million moving parts, any one of which could break. It takes a lot of work to make sure that it's all maintained. Mm -hmm. There is 230 miles of wire. It's incredible. Over a thousand plumbing valves, just mm -hmm. thing open and close. Hey, can liquid go through, can air go through? Mm -hmm. Over 1400 circuit breakers, meaning there's electricity moving along. And if something goes wrong, it's a device that can break the circuit and stop electricity flowing to an area that might be causing a problem. Mm -hmm. All of those things had to be checked and maintained between every single mission. Wow. So it took a lot of money. And then it comes back in down through the atmosphere, lands like a plane. It deploys a parachute out the back to help slow it down. So it comes down very quickly. Yeah. It's, it goes, it's going 17,500 miles an hour when it's in space. Yeah. And it has to come to a rest at zero miles per hour on the ground. Mm -hmm. So... In case we don't have time, or if this isn't a later slide, can you mm -hmm. talk about why the top of the shuttle is this white color, but the bottom of the shuttle is this black color? Yeah, the bottom of the shuttle is black color because all those black bits, those are uh, heat shield tiles. That's made of, um, it's essentially melted sand. It's like a kind of a glassy ceramic uh, material. When you say tile, uh, I, I, I once visited a uh, museum <laughs> in California where you know, this is a few years back because the space shuttle program had ended, but you could actually go visit and like walk underneath the space yeah. shuttle. And I looked up it's and I remember thousands thinking- Thousands of things about this size. Yeah, they just look like little tiles yeah. like you'd see in like your, your kitchen or your bathroom or yeah. something. Yeah, so they, they could replace those tiles between missions, but they didn't have to replace the entire heat shield. They could say, this tile is getting old. This tile needs to be replaced. We'll take that one off and but, put But one these on. ones are still good. Um, and Sometimes the shuttle would land in California and they would need to get it back to Florida for the next mission. Mm -hmm. They had a special 747 that they would stick it on the back of and they could fly it across country. That's and really cool. they would, you know, if I were them, I would want to have a, you know, fighter jet escort too. <laughs> Let's get some cool shots. It looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now, that one on the right looks similar, right? Looks Very familiar, similar. but it's different. That is the Buran, which is the Russian word for snowstorm or blizzard. Mm -hmm. Russia was working on their own space shuttle, hmm. and it actually flew once. Really? 1988, it did an unmanned uh, test flight, mm -hmm. orbited the Earth two times, came back, landed, and then the Soviet Union dissolved, and um, there was no more funding. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so they had to shut down that program, but Russia was pretty close behind us in, in making their own space shuttle. Now, the fact that the, the shuttle itself looks so similar, were they trying to copy like something that we already had? Did we kind of work on this in conjunction with them? It was, was their this... own separate program. But okay. listen, when there's a kid that you're competing with in class and he's doing really well, you know, 
<laughs> I'm See, not saying copy homework, but I'm saying you can take the lessons that other people have learned and apply them to yourself as you're well. You're saying that, so like they saw that, uh, you know, the United States space shuttle worked and they said, let's try to do that too. Yep. Cool. It looks like their, their fuel tank and their, their solid the fuel rocket tank is different. We don't have enough time different. to cover that right now, but mm -hmm. I could definitely go into a lot of specifics about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, are there any final let's, things? Let, let's power we... through. Let, let me just see what the last final. Yeah, all that. There we go. Tell me through the last couple of slides. I think there's only a couple left, and I yeah, know we we're out of time. I know we're out of time. No, that was the last one. Ha ha! Hey, you made it! Yay! <laughs> Listen, I want to talk really quick about Heron Books because these <laughs> webinars wouldn't really be able to be done without the help of Heron Books. A lot of the stuff that we deliver, a lot of the material that we use to deliver these webinars is from Heron Books curriculum. The space shuttle stuff isn't from Heron Books, but the basic lessons that we're using to learn about space are from Heron Books curriculum. We are learning the words, we're learning the definitions of these new words that we come across. Mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're getting familiar with the material in a way that we can actually apply it. So I strongly recommend that you go to heronbooks.com. If you have any interest in working in the field of space, either you wanna become an astronaut or you wanna be one of the tens of thousands of people that support people going to space, you're gonna need math, you're gonna need science, you're gonna need engineering or biology or your own specialized field in order to support the mission of space exploration. It all starts with education. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching today. Uh, we'll see you on Friday for another space science lesson. Um, right. We'll see you later this afternoon for a geography lesson. I'll be teaching a webinar at 115 Pacific time. We're going to be talking about maps. So if you're interested in learning about maps, tune in then and we'll see you next time.